Hello and welcome. I'm Brian Stokely, the Korea TESOL's National Webmaster, here interviewing Dr. Fols, my advisor. I'm in my master's program as the 2011 International Conference, and he was our uh, finest plenary this year. So we're very gifted and happy that he was here. He gave us a, a great, uh, great amount of information that seems that everyone's really, really happy with it. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Foles. So, uh, Dr. Foles, welcome. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you very uh, much. Very nice to be here at Cotisol. Um, this is your first time in Korea, correct? First time not counting a transit in the airport. First so, time I'm really here, yes. So on your 34, 35 years of teaching, you've only come to Korea once. So what's your thought then? You've had a lot of Korean students in Florida, but uh, what are your thoughts about well, I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to see much of Korea so far because of the, the, uh, the conference. But at the conference, I've seen a lot of teachers who are very dedicated, trying very hard to improve their classes. And that matches what I've seen from Korean students in the U.S. We jokingly talk about Korean students in ESL classes as being some of the toughest uh, customers we have because the, ESL, the uh, Korean students know ESL grammar so well. They frequently ask really tough questions in our classes. Excellent. Um, you also, when you gave your plenary, you talked a lot about grammar and, and writing and just uh, how language is learned. Um, of the, the new grammar book that you're creating, that you're producing, uh, can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah. It's for well, the teachers. Well, the, the book that we're talking about is, a, is a, a book of hot seat questions. And what we have is, uh, you know those kind of questions that, that students ask you and you really weren't planning for that particular question? Oh, yes. It wasn't in your lesson, but suddenly the hand goes up and they ask a question about it. So it's a really good question, and many times people aren't prepared to answer that question. So this book is nothing but what I call hot seat questions. It's those questions that students ask you all of a sudden. And what we're trying to produce is, is a book of, of 150 to 200 hot seat questions, and we're looking for teachers, actual classroom teachers, to submit real questions. We would uh, publish your name, or your, your name of your school, and maybe the kinds of students that you teach, whether it's a high school or a community college or a university level. But more importantly, um, that book would be a really good resource in the future for brand new teachers or current teachers who want to be able to prepare for classes better. And I should add that all of the proceeds, all of the royalties from that book are being donated to a scholarship fund at my university, University of Central Florida, nice. for MA, TESOL, and undergrad students so they can attend conferences in the future. Now I can already see questions going up saying, well, you're going to have a, a complete grammar book for teachers that have only 150 to 200 questions. Isn't that a, a meager amount of questions for grammar? It, it would be. You know, 150 might seem like a really small number, but in reality it turns out that as I, the more you've taught, you'll see this too, it's the same kinds of questions that keep popping up over and over. In fact, yesterday after the session, someone asked me a question about why do we say at home? Why don't we use the? And, you know, why isn't it at the home? So, and I, I gave her the answer, but the point is that's a question that's actually already been submitted. <laughs> it, it, my point is, it's the same question that keep okay. popping up. Fantastic. Um, next one, uh, Cengage has uh, sp graciously sponsored you. We're so very happy with Cengage for that. Um, can you tell me about uh, the keys to great writing? Yeah. So the um, with Cengage, I also want to thank Cengage for sponsoring me. They've been very, very generous and very supportive and have a great um, sales staff here in Korea. Um, the, the, the books that I was talking about here primarily are the Great Writing series. So you've got Great Writing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, series of five books uh, practiced from sentences all the way up to super big essays uh, with everything in between, paragraphs, transition from paragraph to essays, etc. It's a series of five books that are used widely, um, at least in the United States and Canada. Um, they're, people like them because the books are full of, of exercise. It's full of great activities. And for someone like, when I started teaching, someone like me, when I first started teaching, I didn't know how to teach writing. And so I learned to teach writing from the book that I was given to use. But, right. but the book really just had a bunch of paragraphs and essays in it. So I didn't, I, it wasn't necessarily very instructive. Although I had the meat to teach, I just didn't know what to do with it. I would say that the books that we have are very popular because if you're not so sure of how to teach writing or you're looking for lots of new activities, these books are full of activities and I, I'll bet you hardly ever, if ever, have to go outside and photocopy or bring in anything extra. These books are full of activities. It's all about getting Thanks. students to write from day one. And uh, I, will be, I will admit that I do use these uh, series and most of the series in my classes. And uh, my students and I are very happy with the results afterwards. And Thank you. <clears throat> they come in, like, I don't know how to write. I said, yes, but you will. And yeah. we'll, we'll get it done. And a lot of encouragement and a lot of positiveness. Uh, they, they have a lot more confidence. And they say, wow, my TOEFL scores and my GRE scores have just gone up so much because mm -hmm. of it. I said, well, and that's why. Yeah. So because it's, uh, it's maybe easy to speak for them, but not, for writing is so difficult. Writing, and, writing is a very difficult area. It really is. And, and it needs instruction, I think. And side note that uh, in Korean government, uh, 
Board of Education is even saying that we need to start focusing more on writing in our classes. Mm -hmm. that we need to start teaching how to write and even at our own university mm -hmm. uh, trying to find experts in this to do this for us. And I said, well, we don't really need experts, we just need expert books. And so yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you did mention on in your plenary about uh, a lot of uh, adjectives, which ones are there, uh, which ones are most used, or a lot of prepositions, the most popular ones. How did you determine which were the most popular ones? Yeah. Well, what you're talking about is there was a slide where we talked about um, prepositions and the fact that there are two kinds of prepositions. The, the easy one, which is the one that everybody thinks of like on the table or in the box, where it depends on whether it's a box or a table. But then there are also prepositions that are triggered by not what comes after it, like box and table, by, but by what comes before it, like um, I was really interested in what you said, or she's dedicated to her job. And so the two where the end gets triggered by not what comes after it, like family or job, but by the word dedicated or the word interested. And that there's a list of, um, uh, in the writing series as well, you'll find this bo vocabulary boxes. And so when you present those adjectives or those nouns or those verbs, we also go ahead and learn the, the uh, preposition that combines with that verb or that adjective or noun. And those are just determined by doing a corpus search. Uh, actually, um, I'm not so fancy with this kind of stuff, but, but just doing a search of using the Corpus of Contemporary American English, yeah, the COCA, the COCA, right? And the COCA has something like, I think, 480 million words in it of, of, um, of North American English. So, yeah, yeah so, right. so it's, it's um, yeah, I, we go in, I just go in and search for the word of and see what I find with it. And then if there are adjective plus of combinations, are, are any of those frequent enough to, to make me actually want to teach that word. So right. something like, I don't know, um, dedicated to, would, would I teach the word dedicated or not? I don't know, but something like interested in, that's a really common yeah. combination and you need that early on. Yeah, I do yeah. like the, um, I'm glad that you used the coca, that's why I asked, is that uh, there was a nice study in TESOL, maybe 2009 by Mark Davies, which mm -hmm. he did a corpus study on uh, phrasal verbs. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. And about a month or two after the publication of TESOL, COCA came available. Mm -hmm. And I said, I wonder if the BNC's COCA, uh, BNC's corpus would render the same results as mm -hmm. the American-based corpus. And sure enough, the, the same 100 phrasal verbs were not in the same order. Uh -huh. But they're generally all the same, but right. very different. So I was very curious about that. So we can mm -hmm. uh, trust your results, I would say. And interesting enough, I actually met Mark Davies last weekend. I, was at, <laughs> I, 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 I also, the COCA is really great. I mean, it's a um, I always tell people you, you sign up and, you know, because it's paid for with a U.S. government grant and uh -huh. they need to have users registered to justify the grant so I'm happy to help them out. COCA is just a really great resource for teachers and I, I never met Mark Davies and interviewed, I mean emailed with him a whole lot and I went to a corpus conference last weekend and lo and behold there he was. Um, I got to meet Mark Davies and talk a little bit about the corpus. It's very cool. cool. Well, in, in that regard, and, and we'll be winding up soon, but the idea is that uh, you, you're an advocate of grammar and of writing, and this has, in the last you know, 10, 15 years, not really received a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Everyone's been focused on just speaking and listening and just having the communicative uh, competence there, and they're really focusing on oral competencies. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you're advocating something that People will say, "Whoa, we're throwing back to the 1970s or 80s." Mm -hmm. What would you say to them on that? I don't. I don't think. Well, first, I don't think it's bad to, uh, to learn from what was in the past. But I don't think it's, I'm not calling for a return to what we used to have of the grammar, the grammar kind of teaching where people, you know, today's whole lesson is an explanation of present perfect in Korean. Uh, we're not trying to train our teach our students to become linguists or teachers. <laughs> they would. You have to ask yourself why would they need to know present perfect? And then if you, if you can't find a, if you, a reason why they would need to know it, then don't teach it. But yeah, with writing, it's a little bit different here, and I'm I'm happy to see uh, focus on writing. If you're teaching writing, how can you not deal with grammar in some, you know, right. some shape or form? Fantastic. So we, what we have is not again. I was saying earlier, this was an important point I made today that what we're trying to do is not a grammar class that has writing attached to it, but a writing class that has a grammar built into it when needed. I would okay. actually at the upper level spend more time on vocabulary than I would on grammar. I, I do want to add one thing, Go not ahead. related to today's um, talk so much. At my university, we have a brand new um, undergraduate certificate program in TEFL, teaching English as a foreign language, and I have a lot of undergrads who have majored in English, biology, business, you name it, and they're interested in teaching abroad. They want to spend one or two years overseas, and many of them are interested in coming to Korea. So if anybody uh, knows of any jobs, <laughs> that my students, they're... they're uh, they have minimal training in, in uh, TEFL. They've had a grammar course. They've had a class in working with conversation. Um, I guess this would primarily be um, 
aimed at language schools here, conversation schools that might be looking for public schools. Will do. Public schools. So I, I've got some people that would like jobs in Korea. We also have people with master's degrees as well who are very qualified. Um, but I, I want to put in a little push for this new um, TEFL um, certificate, which is on Facebook, by the way. So if you go to Facebook, you just put in UCF, my university, University of Central Florida, put in UCF and then a space and then put in TEFL, T-E-F-L, and that should pull it up. University of Central Florida, T-E-F-L. And, and also please like our page, okay? Yes, and also please note that uh, UCF also now has a PhD in TESOL. So uh, yeah. if you want to talk a little bit about that? We have a brand new PhD program started two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a uh, combination with the College of Education, which is where it's housed, and then, and then our College of Arts and Humanities, where uh, all the linguistics people are housed. So uh, and it's, it's really strong on research component. It, it has, I think, four or if not five research classes um, that are nice. required, which is, I think is really heavy. I only had to have three in my PhD, <laughs> so five courses, in, but it also includes a lot of qualitative because this uh, is sort of a big thing, case studies, true. which was not part of, I mean, I'm more a quantitative person, but they get five courses in research methods um, and have to carry out a lot of research. Uh, this spring, now, what, a couple, three or four months, I'll be teaching a class on vocabulary uh, research and research methods for that program. Nice, very interesting. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, not distance um, uh, classes that? Okay. That grammar often serves as the curb appeal of the written work. So it's important to teach grammar and meaningful use of language. Okay. Well, they mentioning grammar, uh, grammar with writing. Yeah. Think about it. How could you possibly, well, even in speaking, we know there's a grammar. So you ask someone, have you ever, have you ever eaten sushi or something? There's a grammar to it. It's present perfect. Have you ever plus past participle. But in writing, the example I gave today was a really good one. If, uh, it's very common that when you um, um, write a, an essay and you want to connect what, you've, what your topic is to the pet, to the uh, to the audience, we frequently use present perfect. For example, many people have recently suggested that the government should blah, blah, blah. Well, many people have suggested. And that have suggested that present perfect, uh, native speakers, I, as I was saying, I've never, and I'm sure you weren't, you weren't ever taught yeah. how to do this. We just know to do it as good writers. And it's just as strong as when we had that thing in English up there with these three guys in a bar, where these, it's a joke, right? Or once upon a time. This is just as strong but somebody needs to point it out to the teacher, to the, to the teachers to be able to teach it to the students. Because I'll tell you, as a native speaker, I'm a good writer, I know to do that, but I was never taught to do it. And since I'm not aware of it, I can't possibly actually turn around and teach it to somebody else. And that's something that, using the, the greats, that series, it will actually help you to, um, to become a better writing teacher. Yes. Now, there was a comment about the online, was it the, the, uh, the, oh, the uh, curb appeal. The curb appeal, yeah. Well, with grammar, Obviously, uh, when you're teaching writing, I don't see how you can't include a grammar component to help your students. And so they know, let's face it, the students, especially here in Korea, they've been trained in grammar, grammar, and grammar. So if you had a class and you say, we're not going to do any grammar, this might rub some people the wrong way as learners because it might make your class look not so serious. It, I don't know. And, and you are including grammar. Just The question is how overt you're going to do this, how, how overtly you're going to do this, and how accountable you're going to make the students for the grammar. Are you going to turn your writing class into a grammar class, which is what I would not recommend. Um, Amen. Yeah, because, because they've had a... They need, they, writing students should be writing, and speaking students should be speaking. And of course there's, there's some, tech, some, what, some patterns, also known as grammar, that you would yes. teach people about this. Yeah. Fantastic. we have any more questions from the chat room? Excellent. Well, Dr. Foles, uh, uh, thank, thank you, you very much very for coming. Very good to see you, and thank you so much. Sure. I've really enjoyed being here at Cote so And remember, my, uh, my send your questions about grammar, mm -hmm. and we'll get plugged into the book. It's mygrammarquestion at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank Cheers. You.